Well, thank you, Corin, uh, and thank you, Sir David, um, for the warm welcome. Um, and if anybody wasn't sure what Rusi did uh, or had any doubts about its relevance, uh, I think Rusi's response and the way that it's risen to the challenge of what's happened in Ukraine underlines just how significant and important an institution and contributor it is. And I, I really congratulate you. Um, and I also want to thank and echo the thanks of the sponsors we have here. Uh, I prefer to them think of them not so much as sponsors as partners. Uh, because this is who we will have to build the future with. So I stand here as the first Chief of the General Staff since 1941 to take up this position in the shadow of a major state-on-state -state land war in Europe. And as I do, I'm reminded of the words of a man in whose footsteps I tread. And in relative obscurity, and recognising the impending danger that the nation faced, the then Brigadier Bernard Montgomery wrote this in the pages of that magnificent publication, the Royal Engineers Journal of 1937. We have got to develop new methods and learn a new technique. There is no need to continue doing a thing merely because it has been done in the army for the last 30 or 40 years. If this is the only reason for doing it, then it's high time we changed and did something else. For us today, that something else is mobilizing the army to meet the new threat we face, a clear and present danger that was realized on the 24th of February when Russia used force to seize territory from Ukraine, a friend of the United Kingdom. But let me be clear, the British Army is not mobilizing to provoke war, it is mobilizing to prevent war. Now, the scale of the war in Ukraine is unprecedented. 103 battalion tactical groups committed up to 33,000 Russian dead, wounded, missing, or captured. A casualty rate of up to 200 per day in the, amongst the Ukrainian defenders. 77,000 square kilometers of territory seized. That's just under half of the total land mass of the Baltic states. Ammunition expenditure rates that would exhaust the combined stockpiles of several NATO countries in a matter of days. The deliberate targeting of civilians, with 4,700 civilian dead and 8 million refugees. For us, the visceral nature of a European land war isn't just some manifestation of distant storm clouds on the horizon. We can see it now. In all my years in uniform, I haven't known such a clear threat to the principles of sovereignty and democracy and the freedom to live without fear of violence, as the brutal aggression of President Putin and his expansionist ambitions. I believe we're living through a history, a period of history as profound as the one our forebears did 80 years ago. And now, as then, our choices will have a disproportionate effect on the future. This is our 1937 moment. We're not at war but we must act rapidly so that we aren't drawn into one through a failure to contain territorial expansion. So surely it's beholden on each of us to ensure that we never find ourselves asking that futile question, should we have done more? I'll do everything in my power to ensure that the British Army plays its part in averting war. I will have an answer to my grandchildren should they ever ask what I did in 2022. So we have agency to prevent war now, but only if we take a new approach. Now, these are extraordinary times, so I won't take the usual approach of a new CGS to this event. It will not be the traditional tour of the horizon covering the full breadth of army business. I'll concentrate on one area alone, how I intend to mobilize the British Army, our regulars, our reservists, and our civilians to deter Russian aggression, to prevent war. Now, we're already a busy army, but today's about mobilization, and to mobilize effectively, we will need to suppress our additive culture and to guard against the tyranny of and. We can't do everything well, and some things are going to have to stop. It will mean ruthless prioritization. So from now, the army will have a singular focus to mobilize, to meet today's threat, and thereby prevent war in Europe. 
This is not the rush to war at the speed of the railway timetables of 1914. It is instead an acceleration of the most important parts of future soldiers' bold modernisation agenda, a move to a positional strategy, an increased focus on readiness and combined arms training, and a broader institutional renewal that creates the culture required to win if called upon. This process, we'll give it a name, Operation Mobilise, will be the Army's primary focus over the coming years. So why do we need to mobilise? Well, under the leadership of the Prime Minister and the Defence Secretary, the United Kingdom has risen to meet Russia's aggression. Defence has worked at a phenomenal pace to bring together a coalition of partners to provide materiel, intelligence and training to sustain Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invaders. Our bilateral relationship with Kyiv has gone from strength to strength. This year alone, we have supplied 9,500 anti-tank missiles, of which over 5,000 were in law. We've already provided UK-based training for 650 armed forces of Ukraine soldiers, and in the coming months, the British Army will deliver battle-winning skills to a further 10,000. It's just started. The upcoming Madrid summit tomorrow is a timely opportunity to demonstrate our leadership in NATO and our enduring commitment to our allies. Mobilising the army to prevent war is as tangible and concrete an act of leadership as I can offer. The UK will lead by example. Now, it's dangerous to assume that Ukraine is a limited conflict. One of its obvious lessons is that Putin's calculations don't always follow our own logic. It's also worth remembering that historically, Russia often starts wars badly. And because Russia wages war at the strategic and not the tactical level, its depth and resilience means it can suffer any number of campaigns, battles and engagements lost, and yet regenerate and still ultimately prevail. History has also shown us that armies that have tasted defeat learn more quickly. And while Russia's conventional capability will be much reduced, for a time at least, Putin's declared intent recently to restore the lands of historic Russia makes any respite temporary and the threat will become even more acute. We don't know how the war in Ukraine will end, but in most scenarios, Russia will be an even greater threat to European security after Ukraine than it was before. The Russian invasion has reminded us of that time-honoured maxim that if you want to avert conflict, you better be prepared to fight. So this is the challenge that I will address through mobilisation. And to make it crystal clear, that means focused on winning the war, working with these allies against this threat in this location. And we'll see the first orders issued in Madrid tomorrow. Now, this threat's also materialised at a time when the world is already looking less secure. The viewpoint set out clearly in last year's Integrated Review and Defence Command paper. In meeting a revanchist Russia, we can't be guilty of myopically chasing the ball. Defence cannot ignore the exponential rise and chronic challenge of China, not just within the South China Sea, but through its sub-threshold activities across the globe. Beijing will be watching our response to Moscow's actions carefully, but ceding more territory to Putin could prove a fatal blow to the principle of national sovereignty that has underpinned the international order since 1945. And we can't allow NATO states to live with the grim reality of the human cost of occupation that we see in front of us. Now, given the commitments of the United States in Asia during the 20s and the 30s, I believe that the burden for conventional deterrence in Europe will fall increasingly to European members of NATO and the GEF. And this is right, in my view. Taking up the burden in Europe means we can free more US resources to ensure that our values and interests are protected in the Indo-Pacific. And we're not alone in facing this reality. Looking out at you here today, I'm reassured by the number of allies and partners I see before me. The faces of friends, from previous campaigns where we've shared hardship and laughter, failures and victories. We've shed blood together. We remember those we left behind. 
And it's this, our willingness to shed blood, to protect common values and each other's territory, that will see us prevail. So how are we going to mobilise? Well, Article 5 remains the cornerstone of our national security. It makes it a critical national interest. And the conflict in Ukraine will herald, I think, a paradigm shift in how NATO delivers collective deterrence, from a doctrine of reacting to crises to one of deterring them. And this principle is at the heart of Opmobilize, Russia knowing that they cannot gain a quick localised victory, that in any circumstances and in any time frame they will lose if they pick a fight with NATO. Deterrence demands all the tools of statecraft, underpinned by soldiers, sailors, aviators and civil servants operating across all five operational domains. It requires forces across defence that are modernised, relevant and harness the potential of the fourth industrial revolution. Effective deterrence also means communicating clearly so we maximise deterrent effects without increasing the risk of mobilisation. But when faced with an adversary such as Mr Putin, with the campaigns of Peter the Great as his reference point, the war in Ukraine also reminds us of the utility of land power. It takes an army to hold and regain territory and defend the people who live there. It takes an army to deter. And this army, the British army, will play its part alongside our allies. And in Ukraine, we've seen the limitations of deterrence by punishment. It's reinforced the importance of deterrence through denial. We must stop Russia seizing territory rather than expecting to respond to a land grab with a delayed counteroffensive. To succeed, the British Army, in conjunction with our NATO allies and partners, must be in place or especially high readiness, ideally a mix of both. Tripwires aren't, aren't enough. If we fail to deter, there are no good choices given the cost of a potential counterattack and the associated nuclear threat. We must therefore meet strength with strength from the outset and be unequivocally prepared to fight for NATO territory. Now, if this battle came, we would likely be outnumbered at the point of attack and fighting like hell. Standoff air, maritime or cyber fires are unlikely to dominate on their own. Land will still be the decisive domain. And though I bow to no one in my advocacy for the need for game-changing digital transformation, to put it bluntly, you can't cyber your way across a river. No single platform, capability or tactic will unlock the problem. Success will be determined by combined arms and multi-domain competence, and mass. Ukraine has also shown that engaging with our adversaries and training, assisting and reassuring our partners is high payoff activity. Future Soldiers New Ranger Regiment, on the ground in Ukraine before the invasion, and the new Security Force Assistance Brigade are well set for this. With the right partner and in the right conditions, persistent engagement and capacity building can be really effective. Operational Orbital has made a key contribution to preparing the armed forces of Ukraine for this fight, and it continues to expand exponentially. And we should be wary of Russia's malign activities further afield. So our global hubs, including Kenya and Oman, will still play a vital role as we seek to mobilize to meet aggression in Europe, allowing us to help our partners there secure strategic advantage elsewhere in the world. This is the war that we are mobilising to prevent by preparing to win with our NATO and GF partners against the Russian threat in Eastern and Northern Europe. And in doing so, it's my hope that we never have to fight it. So what does this mean for the Army? Well, my predecessor and my friend, General Sir Mark Carlton Smith, laid the foundations for the most ambitious transformation of the British Army in a generation, future soldier. We, I, owe him a great debt. The government has also generously committed 41 billion to army equipment over the next decade. But as we face a new reality, a race to mobilize, we must be honest with ourselves about future soldiers' timelines, capability gaps and risks. And now our own diminished stockpiles as a result of gifting in kind to the brave soldiers of the armed forces of Ukraine.
So we shouldn't be afraid of necessary heresies. Defense is only as strong as its weakest domain, and technology doesn't eliminate the relevance of combat mass. So to mobilize the army, I'm going to drive activity across four focused lines of effort. First, and most importantly, boosting readiness. NATO needs high readiness forces that can deploy at short notice for the collective defense of alliance members. Deterring Russia means more of the army ready, more of the time, and ready for high intensity war in Europe. So we'll pick up the pace of combined arms training and major on urban combat. We'll rebuild our stockpiles and review the deployability of our vehicle fleet. And having seen its limitations firsthand as Commander Field Army, I think we need to ask ourselves whether whole fleet management is the right model given the scale of the threat that we face. The time has come to be frank about our ability to fight if called upon. Second, we'll accelerate the modernization outlined in Future Soldier. NATO needs technologically advanced modern armies able to deploy at speed and fight together. They must be able to integrate effects across the domains, all stitched together by a sophisticated and robust command, control and communication network. We'll seek to speed up the delivery of planned new equipments, including long-range fires, attack aviation, persistent surveillance and target acquisition, expeditionary logistic enablers, ground-based air defence, protected mobility and the technologies that will prove pivotal to our digital ambition, CIS and electronic warfare. Most importantly, this will start now and not at some ill-defined point in the future. Third, we'll rethink how we fight. We've been watching the war in Ukraine closely and we're already learning and adapting not least to the help of Rusin. Many of the lessons are not new, but they are now applied. So we'll double down on combined arms maneuver, especially in the deep battle, and we'll devise a new doctrine rooted in geography, integrated with NATO's war plans, and specific enough to drive focused, relevant investment and inspire the imagination of our people to fight and win if called upon. And fourth, I am prepared to look again at the structure of our army. If we judge that revised structures will make the army better prepared to fight in Europe, then we'll follow Monty's advice and do something else. Now, of course, adopting structures has implications for the size of the army. And I know that there will be questions on army numbers locked, loaded, and ready to fire from the audience. Put simply, the threat has changed, and as the threat changes, we'll change with it. My job is to build the best army possible, ready to integrate with fellow services and strategic command, and ready to fight alongside our allies. Nonetheless, it would be perverse if the CGS was advocating reducing the size of the army as a land war rages in Europe and Putin's territorial ambitions extend into the rest of the decade and beyond Ukraine. Importantly, the four mechanisms I've used to illustrate how the army will mobilize will all be initiated from the line of march. This means now, rather than some distant, undefined point in the future. And op mobilize is as much about people as it is about training and hardware. The last 125 days of conflict in Ukraine have shown us, if we needed showing, the enduring nature of war, its violent and human nature, and its timeless interplay of friction and chance. It's reminded us all that war fundamentally remains a clash of wills. Russia's so-called special military operation has shown that while Moscow may have invested in some of the most modernized land technology in the world, it lacked the will to fight when faced with a tenacious Ukrainian defense. Let down by its leaders, we've seen the moral decay of the Russian army play out in front of us. The fighting spirit of our people is the army's greatest, single greatest responsibility. The moral component of fighting power matters. To succeed in mobilizing, we've got to ensure that we engender the culture and the behavior required to forge and cohere a confident and winning team. And in my 37 years experience, I've learned that trust increases tempo. So I'm fully behind the teamwork initiative set up by my predecessor. 
It's not wokeism, nor in any way a lessening of standards at a time when the British Army must be prepared to engage in warfare at its most violent. To put it simply, you don't need to be laddish to be lethal. And in a scrap, you have to truly trust those on your left and right. And when the British Army has been faced with any challenge during its long history, it's always been the ingenuity of our people that has seen us through. I know there will be an opportunity cost to mobilising, and we'll continually review and balance our priorities to meet the emerging threats. But mobilisation also requires us to cut down that which slows us down. So I want you all, and I'm talking to the Army here, to identify those areas of our process and bureaucracy that take up your time. Like any public institution, we've accumulated some barnacles that slow us down. But we're not just any institution, so it's time to strip them back. Mobilisation is not just an internal focus, and we must take industry with us and have the right relationships with our enabling agents to deliver and quicken the ambitious modernisation targets we've set ourselves. I'll use the next few months to engage personally with you, our industry partners, and encourage you to use the framework offered by the new land industrial strategy to make the army more lethal and more effective with better equipment in the hands of our soldiers at best speed. We cannot be lighting the factory furnaces across the nation on the eve of war. This effort must start now if we want to prevent war from happening. Now, by naive, I'd, be, I'd be naive if I ignored the fact that the Army's platform procurement has not been a smooth journey during the last decade. We have the humility to learn the lessons from where it's gone wrong and the confidence to engage with industry to generate the mutual trust required to get the very latest technology for the best value for money. And we should also be a little bit bolder in celebrating our successes. AH-64 Echo is flying now. The first Boxer will be in service in 2023. The first Challenger 3 arrives in 2024. And the Sky Sabre air defence system was deployed and operating in Poland only weeks after entering service. So this speech forms my first order of the day. Mobilisation is now the main effort. We're mobilising the army to help prevent war in Europe by, ready, by, by being ready to fight and win alongside our NATO allies and partners. It'll be hard work, a generational effort, and I expect all ranks to get ready, train hard and engage. We must be practical and cut through unnecessary bureaucracy, be prepared to deprioritise where activity isn't mission critical, honestly highlight risks where we identify them, and avoid falling victim to the say-do gap or the lure of institutional panaceas, conscious of the advice of the late great John le Carré that Whitehall panaceas often simply go out with a whimper, leaving behind the familiar English model. I expect this change to be command-led, and that includes all commanders, from the general in main building to the young lance corporal in the barrack room, from the reservist officer on a weekend exercise to the civil servant in army headquarters. And as we mobilise, I echo the words of General Montgomery to his team in the dust of the North African desert in 1942. We must have confidence in one another. As the new CGS, I have confidence in each and every one of you, and I'm proud to stand among you. And my final message to you is this. This is the moment to defend the democratic values that define us. This is the moment to help our brave Ukrainian allies in their gallant struggle. This is the moment we stand with our friends and partners to maintain peace throughout the rest of Europe. This is our moment. Seize it.